I just want to know. And I probably won't know. <laughs> Why Africa? What's good, y'all? It's the Dumachettes React, and we're back with another video. Who we got today, see? Today we're back with another American Reaction. Yes, yes. Super excited about this video, guys. If you're new to us and, and we're new, new to you, you, make sure you scroll down, hit, hit that, that subscribe button, button, and turn on the post notification bell, because we're, we're on the road to 100K. And we cannot get there without you guys, all right? Join the family. Without further ado, let's get into the video. Britain's criminally stupid attitudes to race and immigration are beyond parody by Frankie Boyle. For those who aren't aware, Frankie Boyle is a famous Scottish comedian okay. who is most renowned for being pretty damn offensive. Needless to say, I'm a fan of his. And so when Frankie Boyle writes an article for The Guardian of all places with the subtitle the anti-immigration election rhetoric is perverse. We fear the arrival of people we have drawn here with the wealth we stole from them. I can see the misinformation coming a mile away. So Frankie begins the article by waffling in an overly verbose manner, reminiscent of Charlie Brooker, another man who I am a fan of, but has been led astray by misinformation. And it's full of these sort of contradictions that I'm sure sounded good when he was writing them, but when you actually think about it, are rather silly. I mean, here he is pointing out the irony of the leaders being nationalist and warning about the Scottish National Party after making a crack about how the Scottish discovered penicillin and taking credit for this for some reason. And for some reason, he seems to mix up the concepts of trade and immigration. But... These really aren't very important. I'm not even bothered that he just assumes that an Australian-style point system for immigration will obviously be a racist system that caters exclusively to white people. You know, this is despite the fact that a Cambridge economics professor has warned the sheer scale of immigration has caused problems for the UK's infrastructure, which was largely built in the 70s. But you know what? None of that really bothers me. What really bothers me is Frankie Boyle's attempt to make British people feel ashamed of Britain's involvement in the slave trade. Oh. That really okay. gets my goat, because Britain's involvement in the slave trade is one of the most proud accomplishments of British history. And I know what you're thinking, oh my goodness, slavery is bad. And that's correct. Which is why the British ended it. For everyone. If we just take a cursory look at the subject, you can see how it is not nearly as cut and dried as Frankie makes it out to be. Even the very word slave comes from Slav, because of the sheer number of Slavs taken as slaves by conquering peoples. But Frankie is trying to drum up white guilt, so let's talk about African slavery. The Portuguese were the first Europeans to start exploring the West African coast, and they did indeed capture African natives to be brought back to Portugal as items of curiosity. Europeans who travelled to Western Africa discovered that Western Africa had civilizations of its own. For example, a Dutch visitor to Benin City wrote in around 1600, As you enter it, the town appears very great. You go into a great broad street, not paved, which seems to be seven or eight times broader than the warmest street in Amsterdam. The houses in this town stand in good order, one close and even with the other, as the houses in Holland stand. More than a century earlier, Benin exchanged ambassadors with Portugal. The Portuguese did take a few Africans back to Europe. But they didn't need to set up operations because they discovered that there were already thriving slave trades in Africa. You know, so, when, when I was younger, I thought everybody was involved. Yes, yes, like, yes. Like, I thought everybody had a piece of the cake. Like, mm -hmm. everybody's like, oh, you get a slave, you get a slave, you get a slave. Right, right. I that's how it was. That's how I felt as well, you know, especially when we got to, like, the um, Christopher Columbus. And mm -hmm. That's how I felt. I felt that it was everywhere. And that's why I don't understand the misconception that people have that... Um, y'all know it was more than just America who had slaves. 
we know that. Yeah. Or enslaved people. Yeah. I had to correct myself. But um, we know that. But uh, I don't know. The part that gets me is I just try to think in the mind of the people way, way back in the day. What was so different, other than the color of our skin, mm -hmm. that they wanted, they were so curious about us? I feel like that's the side of the story they don't tell. Yeah, I, I don't, I right. just it, it gets straight to the point it. like, oh, they're going to get slaves. What, when, why, how? What was this even a thought? You know what I'm saying? When did they, when did, when did they bring Christianity there to show them a, a, a new way of submitting to a master. Ooh. You know what I'm saying? It's like, when did all that happen? Ooh. No one Ooh. talk about that. That's them books that you got to go into the, right. in the vault to get some right. dusty ones. And then that's why, you know, some people today, they have negative feelings towards religion because of how it was weaponized. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a lot you know, of it's so a lot of rewrites. And I, I don't know. I just want to know. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, it's just like um, people... Talking about the way we smell. Huh? Yeah. What we smell? What we smell like? They say we smell like Coca tropical. <laughs> Coconut oil yes. or something. Coconut butter. oil and shea butter. Shea and, butter. Uh, yeah, it, it's like what is the curiosity? A human is a human. <laughs> I, I don't, don't know. know. I just feel like we have a uniqueness about ourselves that just carries out in time and ages and seasons like we always popping in some level you know what i'm saying like whether it's all way in the top see the politicians are way is whether it's someone way at the bottom of the food chain who's homeless and he just one day hit the lottery it's like the, yeah. the uniqueness about this is just wow you know yeah. Yeah. so yeah you got something this was in okay <laughs> and okay. of course okay um i feel like some people don't understand why we always refer it back to ourselves. I mean, but that's why we introduce ourselves as a Democrats react. Yeah, we yeah, always yeah. refer it back to us. We know British. Okay, come on. Because at <laughs> some point, like if you think about it, if we didn't, I mean, yeah, you could dive into the content, but you got to have a real high knowledge of it. So we yeah. only can speak on certain levels based off how it's related to our experience. Right, right. If we have no experience with anything, it would be vegetables. Right. Our fruits, how you, how you said, just right. trying to get... Try to get, yeah, get y'all to understand our perspectives a little bit, but yeah, come that's on. what it is. <laughs> they bought slaves from African rulers and traders. The vast majority of slaves taken out of Africa were sold by African rulers, traders, and military aristocracy who grew wealthy from the business. Most slaves were acquired through wars or by kidnapping. And before you start thinking that this is excessively barbaric, this was the standard for almost every civilized society all across the world. For example, in ancient Greece, Strabo tells us that the island of Delos trafficked in 10,000 slaves a day. That's a lot. Even before the Roman Empire, even when we're coming to the end of the Roman Republic in the first century BC, it's estimated that a third of Italy was made up of slaves. 10,000 a day is a lot of people, yo. Like, y'all went yes. out there and was able to get 10,000. What did y'all put over these people's head to let them just, like, I don't get that. 10, that's that's wild to me. You know, I start thinking about population. And I haven't really looked at, like, you know, the population stats of what, what it could have been back mm -hmm. then. And it makes me think, like, how many people was in Africa during that time? Obviously, more than 10,000. Obviously. I feel, Obviously, hey, you know compared what? Compared to today's time, like oh, 10,000 yeah. a day? Nah, I just think what happened was, because we watched this on Roots, whenever they would go get slaves, they would go to different tribes, mm -hmm. and then they would gather them that way, and, mm -hmm. and I, I guess they just stacked on numbers yeah, they before they made a, a move, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, it's, it's just, I don't know. That's yeah. a lot of people. That's a lot. A day. A That's day. A Alright, man. Uh, let's go. Slaves made up of people whom the Romans had conquered and taken back to Italy to do hard labour. And so to anyone even slightly educated on this subject, it is absolutely unsurprising to find that, for example, in 1510, the capital of the Empire of Songhai was teeming with slaves. Slave trading in West Africa was common but it was different to 
what you expect. It wasn't for commercial purposes. It was to show status and to give the wealthy African elite. And with the appearance of Europeans desperate to buy slaves for use in the Americas, the character of African slave ownership changed. Indeed, it did. The character of slavery on the west coast of Africa changed to look... A I feel like that Ten statement thousands. is made to like make it seem okay. What was the statement? I must have missed it. That the Africans had slaves upon themselves um, to create status for themselves. I understand that. But it doesn't make it okay there. It doesn't make it okay, you know, on any continent. Like, yeah, yeah, it doesn't 100%. make it okay to further it and, oh, they got slaves already. Let me let me make this an end surprise. It, it doesn't yeah, yeah. make it okay. I don't like that. It's kind of, it's kind of like pointing the finger at who did what first on Right, this. right. They did it first. I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> What's more like the character of slavery on the east coast of Africa? because we're going to talk about the Arab slave trade, specifically the circumstance of Swahili-speaking peoples. Unsurprisingly, the Arabs, being far closer to sub-Saharan Africa than the Europeans, had been taking advantage of it for far longer. They were a people with as much commercial nous as anyone else. The ruling class of coastal Swahili society, sultans, government officials and wealthy merchants, used non-Muslim slaves as domestic servants and to work on farms and estates. And they even had plantations, such as the Omani Sultan Said Said, who became immensely rich when he started up clove plantations in the 1820s with slave labour. Arab Muslims settled along the coast and intermixed with the locals, forming a people and culture known as Swahili, which started in around the 10th century AD. So unsurprisingly, the East Africa slave trade was well established long before Europeans arrived on the scene and was driven by demands for labour by the Sultanates of the Middle East. You might be thinking, well, that's interesting. If the Arabs had been in Africa for about a thousand years, taking sub-Saharan African slaves, why isn't there a very large population of black people in Arabia? And the answer to that is that the Arabs used to castrate them cock and balls entirely. A practice that was supposed to have ended in 1962 when slavery was finally outlawed in places like Saudi Arabia. This of course does not mean that the trade has actually stopped, it is still going on today. It's impossible to know exactly how many slaves the Arabs took from sub-Saharan Africa on the east coast. But one historian produced a total of 17 million slaves. I doubt it was that high, but again, we can't know. And it was for over a thousand years that this was happening. The point is that slavery was ubiquitous. No matter where on earth you travelled, you found slaves. In yeah. Europe, in China, in the Middle East, in the New World, in India, in Scandinavia, in Africa, slavery was as common an institution as animal husbandry. The only thing that separated the Christian nations of Western Europe from anyone else on earth was the efficiency with which they could transport taken slaves. And it should come as no surprise that this was made possible by advances in technology that the rest of the world simply didn't have. The most common number I could find regarding the total number of slaves taken from Africa by Europeans was 11 million. And that That's a lot. Um, my thing is, I just want to know, and I probably won't know, <laughs> why Africa? Why Africa? And why everybody wanted a piece? Right. Why everybody wanted a piece? Like, it don't make sense. It's like, oh gosh, this is crazy stuff. I, 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 I don't get that. I know there was slavery in other parts. We did not need this video to tell us that. We are the highlighted version of slaves. G yeah. Like, when it comes to history, though, like, like when they paint the picture of slavery, it's about it's an image of a black individual, period. 
You know what I'm saying? I mean, I know people are quick to say, well, they had slaves, these this, that, and the third, and other races, this, that, and the third. Yeah. But when you look at history, this is the highlighted version of it. Right, right. You know, so. Because, I mean, the, earlier he talked about how um, Africans owned slaves themselves, um, you know, to create their status or support their status. They, they wasn't going nowhere else to get them. It was their own people. So... Why? And this is... And how can you... You know what I'm saying? I would like for people to answer that without making it biblical. Mm. Mm. I would like to hear it in a way that just... Like, what was the reason? What was the mindset? What, what was, was the, the reason? What was the reason? <laughs> yeah. That oh, is in geez. about a 400 year time span. Portugal took the most slaves with oh, over four Portugal and a half million transported mm -hmm. to the new world. Then Britain with over history. two and a half million, then Spain and France totaling just under three million. And just so no one is under any illusions, the transatlantic slave trade must have been close to all these black people, bro. Like, really? At the end of the day, everybody wanted a black guy and a black girl, and they wanted to, like, out of it, just don't make sense to me. Like, when you really sit back, like, sit back for a second and just think about it. Like, just think about that for a minute. Just think about it. It blows me away, bro. Like, it really do. And it's like, people say get over slavery. Oh, no. It doesn't need to always be talked about to some extent because it's like, the whole, every, like, again, when I was coming up, I really thought everybody did it to us. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Nobody was exempt. Everybody did it. And... No, nah, you can't get over that because I feel like if no, nah, you just you shouldn't. My thing is, it's it's people don't realize, and I bring up my grandmother a lot so people can understand. My grandmother walked the earth. My grandmother is still living. My grandmother is early nineties, <sighs> ninety one, ninety two, mm -hmm. one of them, um, ninety. <sighs> she walked the earth with the last of them. She. Witnessed the lynchings. She witnessed um, all of the laws that were in place. She was not able to stay at home with her child because there was laws in place that she had to go to work. That is why it's like the remnants of that is still here, at least in the United States. The remnants of that is still here. So it's like when people say, and, and I hate seeing pictures like this, and I know pictures like yeah, this. Yeah, this picture needed. blew me though. Like, this was just. But it's like. That's not even. This makes me wonder the attitude. Look at us. Why are we tied up? Well, I know why we're tied up. Because if we wasn't tied up, we'll be it wouldn't look like back. this. We'll be heading back home. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll be heading back. But, um. It makes me think like when, you know, when certain people look at us, what do y'all see? It's like because at the end of the day, I feel that, I mean, it's, that's what they want at some point to make the idea of, you know, just knowing about slavery, making that idea extinct. Right. You know what I'm saying? As if, oh, come on, get over it. And yeah. just don't worry about it no more. Leave it where it's at. You know what I'm saying? But that's like a chunk of life that you just can't Until erase. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You can't erase that big chunk of life and then expect for everything to come off as whatever it is may come off as. Mm -hmm. It just don't it just don't sit. Like mm, there's some things I wanna say, but I don't feel that some people are mature enough to understand the the things that I wanna say. So Ooh. They mindset, it don't move. It don't move for real. <laughs> Get it over it. <laughs> it's not that we it stuck on move. it. It's it's why is it so hard for y'all to understand? How yeah, I'm, I'm saying because I feel like when people can own up to the realization of it, a piece of you starts to shatter and it hurts mm -hmm. because you've been taught different. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that's how that's all it is. Yeah. Hell on earth. Slaves were taken from Africa and packed into conditions so disgraceful and disgusting it is unsurprising that there was such a high mortality rate for the crossing. Yeah. As offensive as this is to look at, we have to remember that this is a consequence 
of dehumanization. The slaves were not people, they were chattel. It will obviously come as absolutely no surprise that the driving motivation behind slavery was economic. Portuguese merchants traded with Africans from trading posts they set up along the coast. Mm. They exchanged items like brass that. and copper bracelets for such products as pepper, cloth, beads and slaves, all part of an existing internal African trade. But the transatlantic slave trade really took off when Christopher Columbus discovered the New World. The Portuguese initially had a monopoly on the slave trade, but this was broken in the 16th century when England, followed by France and other European nations, entered the trade. Unsurprisingly, this was a massive... Now that I think about it, we didn't only just build everything. We was top dollar. <laughs> what? Top dollar, but I mean... I mean, no, like, if you seriously think about it, we was the reason riches was being birthed into families we was the reason families was eating and, and and obtaining cattle food wealth uh everything that's just you get you know what that I'm saying? they like, still have that today. they still have today like it was they still that's what get over slavery like if you were to think about it <laughs> though it was the... wrong we was not just excellent workers mm -hmm. We was top dollar workers. Top dollar, like they work real good. But now we call lazy. How they go? <laughs> how they go? Not funny. Oh my god, that's wrong like, okay. to me, bro. Like if you put two and two together, how we was treated then and how we are looked upon and now, it's like what happened? How, when did y'all switch y'all head around and say that we not what we was? Like before y'all yeah. even made people slaves and stuff like, and then y'all seen them working, then y'all was like. How'd it go, bro? That's weird to me. It's, it's weird. It's very weird. Well, I got a point. You did have a point. So, go ahead, go ahead, so go ahead. get over slavery. But the same businesses that was formed, the same fortune, the same legacy, the same people who are wealthy today. Some of them, not everybody. Not everybody. Some. Yeah. But some where their family businesses were created during those times are still reaping the benefits. Okay, so we gotta get over slavery. Everybody else gotta get over it. Give your business up. Cause slaves, Lord, cause slaves <laughs> was top dollar that contributed to the to 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 a business functioning. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. You sell this person, I take the money, I put it into my business. You sell this person to me, I make them work, I flourish my business. Yeah. It's like yo. We was the water and the boat. Mm, David, we was everything. We made everything float. Everything. I think I'm about to rhyme if I say another line because it's always <laughs> going to be dope. <laughs> I, can't I can't stop it started. The profitable trade for everyone involved except the slaves. Africa's rulers, traders, and military aristocracy protected their interest in the slave trade. They discouraged Europeans from leaving the coastal areas to venture to the interior of the continent. European trading companies realized the benefit of dealing with African suppliers and not unnecessarily antagonizing them. The companies could not have mustered the resources it would have taken to directly capture the tens of millions of people shipped out of Africa. It was far more sensible and safer to give Africans guns to fight in the many wars that yielded captives for trade. The slave trading network stretched deep into Africa's interior. Slave trading firms were aware of their dependency on African suppliers, were making insane amounts of money for example the king of Look benin was making 250,000 pound a year selling people into slavery in 1750 and you're and telling me that none of that money was going into y'all businesses and y'all families that people are still reaping the business of of today you t tell me that's not what it is because the mindsets of these people was business at its at its top tier because they knew that everything that they was doing was from the cotton, from the people. Everything was just business. Like, we're going to make this money. Man, <sighs> that's a, a year? Okay. Mm. His successor said in the 1840s that he would do anything the British wanted him to do, apart from giving up the slave trade. Quote, the slave trade is the ruling principle of my people. Wow, wow, it is wow. the source and the glory of their wealth. The mother lulls the child to sleep with notes of triumph 
over an enemy reduced to slavery. With an industry so profitable to so many people involved, and so widespread as to be common to almost every nation on earth, why would the British want King Gezo to give up the slave trade? Well, we need to turn back the clock to 1066, yes, back of that stuff is hard when a French-speaking so, Duke of Viking descent called William the Bastard defeated King Harold Godwinson of England. William the Bastard was refashioned as William the Conqueror and took the crown of England. And one of the th first things he did as King of England was to have the entire country inventoried. This record was known as the Doomsday Book, and we still have it. Oh, Thanks to oh, this wow. hard work, we know that around 1086, 10% 10 of the recorded population of England were slaves. 20 years earlier, when he had first conquered England, William had enacted a series of laws, one of which prohibited the slave trade out of England. I prohibit the sale of a man by another outside of the country on pain of a fine paid in full to me. We don't know what William's motivation for making this law was, but given that the punishment for breaking it was a fine, I doubt it was for humanitarian reasons. Whatever his reasons, within a generation of 1086, slavery had almost died out in England. Presumably because William the Conqueror had outlawed the trade of slaves. There appears to also have been a trend for lords to endow their slaves to perform their ploughing functions as free ploughmen. While not a wonderful state of affairs, serfdom is better than chattel slavery. And this state of affairs was solidified by the church at the Synod of Westminster in 1102, where the church denounced simony, clerical marriages and slavery. This made England a very unique case. There probably wasn't another country in the world at this time that had outlawed slavery. Hmm. Now, I have heard of this on the movie. <laughs> yeah. But I have not heard of the lives of the ex-enslaved people in England. I think that will be very, very interesting to discover. Right. Now, I do know I did watch a movie, and it probably was the same movie. It was, I can't really recall everything. But this was like 10 years ago I watched this movie. Because I remember ago. it was one of those little, um, the movies that we got from Raybox. That's what it's called, Raybox. Oh, Lord, the Raybox yeah. days. So it was like a princess, and she was black, and she was in England. So I don't really remember. If you know what I'm talking about, let me know. There were practically no motivations to do so. It was incredibly lucrative, endemic to the point of normalcy, so it wasn't even viewed as immoral, and the chances are William the Conqueror himself made the slave trade in England illegal just so he could make a quick buck. Fast forward 700 years, and the international transatlantic slave trade is in full swing. Child, and just so he could make a buck. As long as it's ended and it's illegal, okay. Let him make his books for the people that try to yeah, yeah I know uh, he'll still make money. Yeah, let, let him make his books. He he Ooh, ended Lord, it. What a habit they had to break. For real, for free. <laughs> <laughs> Yet we still do not have slaves in England, and this is where we meet a man named Granville Sharp, a very well-educated rationalist thinker of the Enlightenment who became an active campaigner for the abolition of the slave trade. Granville had had previous legal success defending Jonathan Strong from his erstwhile slave master after being brought to England from the colonies, but we're going to look at the subsequent Somerset case. James Somerset was a slave from Virginia in America, oh. who had come to England with his master Charles Stewart in 1769, and had run away in October 1771. After evading slave hunters employed by Stuart for 56 days... No matter how long it took, the boy was still trying to get away. Yeah. I don't care what treatment you may seem. It was like... you Like, they try to normalize it so mm. much. And I'm talking about after years and past, and now you get to ride with me here, and we get to go over here and check mm. these things out. Let me know. You just stay put. Stay put. Yeah. Them boys hopping up. That's when they would dress them up. Yeah, try to make them, yeah. Try, try to call them um, their helper or something. Because 
I've read a lot of books, you know, mm -hmm. on slavery. Mm. And they would try to dress them up. Oh, we're going to England to this and do work. And they would employ them as, um, you know, musicians and different things that they were going to England for. And then they'll get caught. Because they would run away and, and the people would tell on them. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Take me to England, please. <laughs> <laughs> Somerset had been caught, put onto the slave ship Anne and Mary to be taken to Jamaica and sold. Oh, Three nice. Londoners had applied to Lord Mansfield for a writ of habeas corpus, which had been granted, with Somerset having to appear at a hearing on the 24th of January in 1772. Members of the public responded to the plight by sending money to pay for his lawyers, who in any event gave their services pro bono publico while Stuart's costs were met by the West Indian planters and merchants. Given his prior legal experience with the Jonathan Strong case, Sharp briefed Somerset's lawyers. The judgment was delivered on the 22nd of June 1772, and it was a clear victory for Somerset, Sharp, and the lawyers who had acted for Somerset. Child, they didn't have a GoFundMe back in the day. Before it was a GoFundMe? Before it was a GoFundMe. They fund... Look at that! Yeah, yeah, Look. yeah. Look what happens when people come together for a good cause. Mm -hmm. Mansfeld acknowledged that English law did not allow slavery, and only a new act of Parliament could bring it into legality. Mm -hmm. The verdict established one thing very clearly. A slave becomes free the moment he sets foot on English soil. Bring me the English! And this was, according yes, to wrist, Mansfeld... <laughs> My wrist is in England. The air of England is too go. pure for any. <laughs> my wrist, my wrist. <laughs> Baby, as soon as I see it, oh, baby. just fall out. Just, oh, just wait, everything. Wait. We can't take nothing serious. Cause as soon as I see it, oh, I'm acting funny up in that Works. little cabin car. Oh yeah, hey, oh, hello, but I got, I got to use the restroom. <laughs> I gotta go now. <laughs> we right here by the England border. Let's keep pushing. No, we gotta pull over. No, I'm gonna pull yeah. over. I'm gonna hop out. Uh huh. For yes, real. yes. It would have been me. Open my door. Open your own door, <laughs> baby. I am free. Right, man. <laughs> Why you just step foot out there? My toe. Slave to door. Yeah, because if they would have caught you out there, and then they're talking about, are we taking him back? Oh no, now you need to pay me because we don't do that out here. That's a fine. Oh, let me take me to we, the king. But them boy had them big books too. <laughs> <laughs> you right here in this six section code. Yeah, mm -hmm. we don't do that. Now you gotta pay me a fine up. Yeah, sir, bring it on. Yeah, you know how we, when we're taught to uh, to call fire, fire, and, and mm. scream another word, and mm. go scream grape. Mm. You know all those words. I've been like, he captured me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Holding me hostage. Oh, Trying to enslave me. That's a long. Call the king. <laughs> that's a long panic word. Dude, shoot. King. Wait. Right, so. Slave. I don't know. Boy. So. Shoot. <clears throat> no matter what reason William the Conqueror outlawed slavery for, by the time this judgment was drawn by Lord Mansfeld, it had become a point of principle. This precedent wasn't set for Mansfeld's personal interests. This precedent was set to determine right from wrong. Exactly. Granville Sharp went on to co-found the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade with fellow like-minded Enlightenment thinkers. And after 20 long years of campaigning in Parliament, which I won't detail here, they were successful in their goal of abolishing the international slave trade in 1807. Now, if you know anything about 1807, you'll know that this was during the War of the Fourth Coalition, where Napoleon Bonaparte was savaging great powers all across the European continent. The Napoleonic Wars led to new territorial acquisitions for Britain, and helped stuff Parliament with more abolitionists than they had before, which is why the bill providing for the abolition of the slave trade to conquered territories triumphantly passed in both houses. Mm. And the following year, this was superseded by a stronger measure that outlawed the British Atlantic slave trade altogether. But, given the raging war in Europe, it was rather difficult to enforce due to a paucity of available resources. After 1807, the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade, having achieved its goals, became the African institution, whose principal aim was to ensure the new legislation was enforced and that other countries followed Britain's example. Persu Did y'all hear what they said that I had trumped both houses? Y'all gotta vote. Mm -hmm. That's all that means. Yeah. You gotta vote. 
I mean, the, when the numbers come in and then they try to, you know, people going to be sneaky. They got people who do what they want to do when they want to do it. But then you're always going to have those that sit and also inside of them that's fighting for the right cause. And them numbers is going to come out regardless. Right. You can't hide the truth, bro. Like, you got to vote. That's all that means. You got to exercise your right before your right be taken away. Again. Getting other countries to join Britain out lowering the slave trade proved more difficult. Despite the efforts of the African institution and those of British ministers, the Congresses of Paris and Vienna in 1814 and 1815 both failed to reach a specific agreement. Given that this was at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, it's hardly surprising that there was French opposition. Where diplomacy had failed, the Royal Navy had to succeed. It's one thing declaring a writ that people may no longer profit from the trading of human beings, it's another thing to enforce that. Enter the West African Squadron. The West Africa Squadron was a detachment of the Royal Navy that was given the task of blockading Africa, the continent, to make sure that slave traders were not taking slaves to the Americas. Wow. Needless to say, in 1807, there was only a token force performing this operation, comprising of two ships. This oh, number was increased to five ships until the War of 1812 with the United States. Cannon. But after 1815, with Britain victorious in Europe and supreme at sea, the Royal Navy turned its attention back to the challenge. The institution of slavery was formally abolished in the British Empire in 1833. And by the 1850s, around 25 vessels and 2,000 officers and men were on the station, supported by nearly a thousand crewmen. Experienced fishermen recruited as sailors from what is now the coast of modern Liberia. It's worth noting that this was not a pleasant job, and the mortality rate was five times higher for f compared with fleets in the Mediterranean or in home waters. To help incentivize the crew, money was actually given to each crew per slave that they freed. But there was a real zeitgeist in Britain for the abolition of slavery. For example, the pursuit and capture of slave ships became celebrated naval engagements, widely reported back in peacetime Britain. They became a source of national pride. So it's no wonder that many of the crews really did have an evangelical zeal about the anti-slavery patrolling. However, I don't want to give the impression that this was all for humanitarian reasons. There's no doubt it's that Britain, so. in her foreign policy, used her anti-slavery laws as a stick with which to beat her opponents, primarily the Spaniards and the Portuguese, who refused to conform to these demands. Britain demanded Spain, Portugal and the very new nation of Brazil to declare slave trading to be piracy. And while these nations paid lip service to these principles, they failed to enforce them, which led to a British blockade of Brazil by 1850 which, of course, forced the nascent Brazilian Empire to capitulate. And it didn't end there. In the 1860s, David Livingstone reports of Arab atrocities against enslaved Africans stirred up the interest of the British public, reviving the flagging abolitionist movement. Throughout the 1870s, the Navy attempted to suppress this abominable eastern trade at Zanzibar in particular. Needless to say, the British Navy continued their mission against the slavers across the Indian Ocean. The abolition of slavery became the British project. It captured the hearts and minds of the entire country, from the highest lord to the lowest peasant. This is certainly how the British saw it. For example, this spirit of chivalry, we see it in acts of heroism by land and sea, in fights against the slave trade. Alfred Tennyson, the unweary, unostentatious, and inglorious crusade of England against slavery may probably be regarded as among the three or four perfectly virtuous pages comprised in the history of nations. William Leckie. All of this was done against the vested financial interests of hundreds of thousands of people. Entire nations were against the idea of abolishing slavery and the slave trade. The very notion was alien to the human existence until Britain made it happen. In the 19th century, if you saw a ship bearing down on you, flying this flag, and you were a slave trader, you knew that this flag stood for liberty. This was the flag of a nation 
the defied human convention for a point of principle and spent its blood, sweat, tears and treasure to enforce it on the world. This is the flag of the nation that accepted the absolute moral truth that slavery is wrong. No matter what riches can be amassed, no matter what power can be gained, no matter the cost, slavery had to be abolished. That was the British Crusade. When Britain held the reins of world power, that is what she did with it. So, Frankie, to be honest with you, when you say we have streets named after that slave owners, be my next we have profited question. from a vile crime and feel no shame. It is British people that don't learn languages or British history. Did, but didn't we protest for this before? For what? For slaves' names as owners. Yeah, now, we have. Yeah. You mean recent modern times? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, yes, of yes. course. Not yes, then. it's changing. But, um, yeah, my next question was if they had this attitude towards ending slavery, what was the change for colonialism? Like, why was that introduced? If they fought so hard to get the whole world on board with abolishing slavery, what was the sudden change? Because in a way, I, I see, you know, it, it, it gave people resources, education, it, it helped them. But it just is, it, it's basically like the same, it's one of the same, two of the same, you know? Well, he did mention that there was still a benefit. Oh, to them? Yeah. Oh, so for money. Yeah, that's what he said. It was about the money. Everything Cause was the about fine, money. The, when the fine was being put in place, oh, you can only imagine mm -hmm. how much you made. Yeah. So. Whew. Britain is the true scrounger, the true criminal. I have to concur. British people apparently do not learn British history because Britain's involvement in the slave trade is one of the most proud moments any nation could have had in their history. I want to make one thing crystal clear, Frankie. You live in a world without slavery because of Britain. I'm so tired All of people right. plucking a, a wrong from history. Plucking a wrong from history. This was a good video. He broke it all the way down. He did. Yeah, he almost had me standing up at the end when he got real, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the seriousness. You felt it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, But, bro, like, so much undiscovered, so much. Well, let me just put it like this. So much things that need to be said that's being said, but it's not making it to the ears. You know what I'm saying? Because some a lot of people are still fixed with how things was told mm -hmm. to them about slavery. Right, right, like, right. this is brand new. You know what I'm saying? For mm -hmm. some people, this is like, oh, no, we've been knowing about this. We, But for a lot of people, this is brand new. Yeah, yeah. For a lot of people, I agree. Um, Really, really good video. Really detailed. He broke it down, baby. He threw it in his face, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I just wish the world would get on board with abolishing slavery in the other areas you know that's still going on today like i watch a video actually seeing people um what they were doing they were creating bricks and just bricks and just bricks all day long the mama the daddy the children just creating bricks all day long and, and they said it, they have been enslaved for years and they're going to continue to be enslaved for years and their children are going to be enslaved for years and i'm like in what world because baby me Again, I told y'all, I couldn't be back in the day. I, I'm so thankful for my ancestors because it, it couldn't be me. Because cause there would be no, no my lineage would have stopped at me. Oh, God. I just know it would have. You want me to do what? You going to do it? It's hot. <laughs> that's, that's what would have. My finger bleed. That's not what, that's not what it went down like that. Yeah, yeah I would have been gone the moment I would have yeah, opened my mouth. Yeah. Just, <laughs> I, but not just that, like they were they, they were conditioning them in, in so such a manner that made them second think a lot of stuff. Like, I'm gonna do this behind your back. Yo, we gonna leave tonight. Baby, I was hairy. Because we ain't trying to get that happy. You see what happened to little Jim? 
I was Harry. Yeah, like real talk. You know what I'm saying? So Let I, my I, people go. They said she used to sing a song and they knew it was her coming. They oh yeah, been yeah, yeah. Y'all been antagonizing everybody. Come on, come on, Shirley. Oh, I had a freestyle. <laughs> what you did? What you did? <laughs> Shoot, I would have said something crazy. I was like, "Thought of the star." <laughs> For real. Here I come. You know who you are. You better run. And look so, me, look me packing my little rags. Oh, that sound like Brother Dion uh -huh. coming up from around them bushes. I'm coming. Here I go. I'm coming. Bro, but it yeah, sucked I... because you had them one, that little one individual who would oh, be like, bro, everybody. just afraid. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you are living in a time where it's do or die. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you living in a you living in an environment that doesn't, well, like, it's the nature, it's just not your, 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 your state of place. Strong. So, yeah. A lot of people are strong. 100%. Even the weakest ones. Yeah, they're strong. They lived in a time I couldn't comprehend. It's amazing, man. It's, I couldn't it is Tell amazing. Tell all right, y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we hope you guys enjoyed this video with us. Like this video, subscribe, turn on the post notification bell. We have enabled our super, super thanks, thanks if you like to support the channel that way, as well as our reaction request form is in our description box below. We'll see you soon. Peace.